Welcome to the second episode of Scientific Dialogue. Today we have with us a very special guest, Dr. Muntazir Abidi. Sir, before starting off, I would like to ask you, how are you doing? Uh, I'm good. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, sir, um, I've been going through your background and it seems pretty interesting that you have been to some of the best research institutions in the world, such as ICTP, and then you went on to uh, also do your PhD at Cambridge and work on Cosmos Supercomputer. Why don't you start off by telling us about your thesis and what you researched there as well? Okay, thanks. Um, my research uh, was, uh, so I went to a good institute. Uh, I went to ICTP uh, for postgraduate diploma in high energy physics. And I, then I went to uh, Cambridge University for my master's. For my PhD, I started working on, uh, cosmo I joined the cosmology group. And, um, and the focus of my research was on the large scale structure formation in the universe. So large scale structure formation is, uh, so basically just to let you know that the, what is the difference between cosmology and astrophysics. So in astrophysics, we focus on, uh, on the physics of, uh, of objects like uh, galaxies and stars. But in, um, in cosmology, we look at the whole universe. So if you look at the how we look at how galaxies are distributed in the universe. For example, how billions of galaxies are distributed in the universe. This is what we do in cosmology. But if you look at one individual galaxy, that's a uh, count in astrophysics. Um, so in cosmology, what I did is I, I, I studied the, how, the, how, how the structures are formed in the universe. So, um, so what basically, my work was on precision cosmology. So precision cosmology is like we have a lot of data coming from, from galaxy surveys and, and also from cosmic microwave background radiations. So, so, so the data coming from galaxy surveys, um, we have uh, how can we extract information about fundamental physics and about the universe and how precisely we can measure some parameters from this data. So how, developing statistical methods and testing those methods on computer simulations, as you mentioned, Cosmos uh, is the uh, supercomputer uh, at Cambridge. So measuring um, those, uh, applying those methods on Cosmos supercomputer before applying to the data. And this is very important because, uh, because we can only observe the universe once and uh, because we can only do the observation once, we don't know what we are observing is actually the noise or signal, right? And we don't know how to quantify errors because if you do experiments in lab, you can do experiments multiple times and then take the mean and average, uh, average and the variance of, of your results. But when you do the observations of the universe, you can do it only once. And so what you observe, you don't know what is the signal and what is the noise. So what we, what we do is we build our models, theoretical models, and then we, then we apply these models to computer simulations because the computer simulations give us kind of the exact realization of the observed universe. So when we test our models on computer simulations, we know that this works. And then when we know that this works, we can apply this to the actual data analysis. So more specifically, what I did is when you observe the universe, you observe the galaxies, how galaxies are distributed, but the information about the universe that about the cosmology uh, is encoded in the underlying dark matter distribution. And dark matter is like normal matter, which is dark. We, do, we know that there is some kind of a matter which, which contains like, which has the normal properties of the matter, but it is dark, it doesn't interact with the light. So we cannot observe it. The only way we can observe, one of the ways, not the only way, the, one of the ways that we can observe the dark matter is by looking at how galaxies are distributed in the universe. So galaxies face the distribution of dark matter. And this distribution is, um, is not, uh, it's not a linear relation. It's a very complex relationship. So if you look at the galaxies, how galaxies are distributed and convert this uh, data into the distribution of dark matter, and this relationship, that the relationship between how the galaxies are distributed and how the underlying dark matter is distributed, it's called galaxy bias problem. Okay, and this is a very complicated problem. So my PhD, half of my PhD, more than half of my PhD research was focused on understanding how 
to quantify different terms in this bias relationship. And I applied this method to the computer simulation. We quantify the existence of some very interesting uh, parameters, which tells a lot about not only this distribution, but it also tells a lot about the physics of the underlying matter distribution. And also these measurements can improve the measurements of the cosmological parameters quite a lot. And I can tell you more in detail, like how it goes, but, but this is one of the things that I did. And, um, and then I also did several projects, but my mostly like the projects and research are focused on the large scale structure formation and how we can extract actually the initial conditions uh, from the data. So given the, given what we observe is the non, is a complex nonlinear matter distribution. And by looking at what we observe, can we interpret or can we extract information about the initial conditions of the universe? Because once we can extract the initial conditions of the universe, we can tell a lot about how universe was started. So that was also one of the part of my research. Um, sir, so basically you collected data and then applied some data science methods to those data. That's the, that's the point you're trying to say, right? Yeah. So, so the idea is like, you know, you, so, as a cosmologist, okay, we do uh, we do um, physics, but when you do the research, so so one part is the, the physics, of course, you have to understand physics, but the second part is uh, statistical modeling. You develop like statistical methods or higher dimensional statistics, and then the other part is computer simulations. You do like a lot of coding and apply this method to high performance computing simulations, and then you do uh, to the data analysis. So for the data analysis, you can actually do the data analysis with the simulation data, or you can do the data analysis with the directly observed galaxies. But that's a very complicated thing. And, and I'd never like applied my methods to actual data coming from the galaxies. I only did uh, uh, computer simulation. But, but that's a whole different field because the data which you observe is very complicated. Um, so can you tell us more about some of the interesting problems which are currently open for discussion in cosmology right now? Um, so, I mean, in cosmology, there it's actually it's a very interesting field right now. And there are a lot of uh, uh, open problems. So one of the problems, so I mean, um, for those who do not understand, uh, the past 20 years, 10 to 20 years, have been amazing because our understanding of the universe have changed dramatically. And there were like experiments like WMAP by, and, uh, and Planck's um, more specifically uh, changed our understanding of, how, uh, of the universe. Um, and because we, I mean, we do have a lot of information from Planck, but still there are, there are quite a lot of limitations. And one of the limitations of the cosmic microwave background radiation was that it's a two-dimensional projection of the universe. What you observe is not the three-dimensional universe. What you observe is a two-dimensional projection. And so when you go from three dimension to two dimension, you lose one dimension. And so you are losing a lot of information and also a lot of foreground effect. When light has been traveling, there are a lot of things like it passes by, passes through to galaxies and quasars and all those nebulas and everything. And so these objects affects, um, and we and to remove these effects is quite, quite difficult. Um, so nowadays, all these cosmological surveys have been focusing on uh, detecting lights coming from different galaxies. So the three-dimensional surveys, galaxy surveys. So there are different examples. There are some experiments which are called photometric survey. There are some experiments which are called spectroscopic survey and the radio telescope surveys and also gravitational wave experiments. And um, so, so, so we hope that a lot of data will come and eventually we will answer a lot of unanswered questions. And coming back to your answer question, what are the, um, what are the questions? So we do know from Planck, we do know that the, that the universe is dominated by dark matter and dark energy is 25 around 25 percent of the universe is dominated by dark matter is a matter which we cannot observe around 75 percent of the universe 70 percent of the universe is dominated by something called dark energy so it's like energy which we do not know the nature i mean we do not know the nature of this dark energy we call it dark energy 
and only like less than 5% of the universe is what we observe it's like which is made up of ordinary matter uh, like stars and galaxies and light and and us for example we just it what is what we observe in the universe is just less than 5% more than 95% of the universe is still dark we do not know and so the nature of dark matter what is the nature of dark matter we do not know there are a lot of candidates for dark matter theory but we do not know what is the nature of dark matter what is the nature of dark energy we do not know what is the property of dark energy we actually do know what is the property of dark energy dark energy is something which repels so gravity or matter attracts but dark energy is dark energy is something which repels so we do know so one of the things that we also learned recently is that the universe is not only expanding it's actually accelerating so in 1998 some 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 uh, some team in different parts of the world like three different teams they 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 were detecting the deceleration of the universe by looking at the quasars observations and what we, what they observed is that uh, the they were surprised to detect that the universe is not decelerating it's actually accelerating and the nature and one of the reasons why the universe is accelerating is because of the presence of dark energy and this dark energy is very similar to the cosmological constant in the einstein equation and so einstein when he gave the theory of gravity he there are different predictions uh, from the theory of gravity you can you can predict about about the future of the universe and one of the one of the prediction is okay the universe uh, is will expand forever and then einstein actually wanted a static universe the idea of the static universe so when you when you when something is accelerate uh, expanding or decelerating he added something to counteract the effect of gravity to make it more sta uh, stationary but then during the same time hubble actually um, observed that uh, the universe is accelerating is expanding not accelerating is expanding and so hubble convinced einstein that the universe is not stationary and then einstein removed his term but then later on people added that term back um, so people say einstein said he it was his bl biggest blunder but i don't know whether he exactly said that or people made it up but actually it was like he removed this term and then later on people uh, added this term and the acceleration of the universe is exactly due to the presence of this cosmological constant term which we call dark energy but we still don't know the nature of dark energy so that's the biggest problem we still do not know the nature of dark matter second problem we still do not know actually whether einstein theory is still the correct theory of gravity or there are there is a modification at different scales so the theory of einstein has been test has been tested on different scales it has been tested or uh, at the scale of solar system recently people have detected uh, or reconstructed an image of uh, of a black hole and the black hole horizon is exactly what they observed is so what they observed when they reconstructed the image of black hole the horizon of the black hole is exactly what uh, uh, the theory of gravity predicts so it's one of the test for uh, for the for the einstein theory of gravity but on a very large scales on the scales when you do not even look at the galaxy but you look at the clusters of galaxies so at the scale when you look at the clusters of galaxies um it has not been tested and people who do not understand the the scales when i'm talking about galaxies and the clusters of galaxies just to give you an idea like the scales i'm talking about our galaxy which is called milky way right it consists of almost 100 billion stars so our sun is one star right and the light coming from so light when it travels from sun to to earth it takes 8 minutes right and light with with its speed like 3 meter per eight meter per second it can take three rounds around the earth in one second right almost so it takes 3 minutes right the distance of the milky way is if the light started to travel from one end and it ends to another end it will take almost 1 million or 200000 i think thousands of years thousands of years if light travels thousands of years 
it will like not thousand, but it's actually much more than that. I do not know the exact figure in light in light light years how big the galaxy is. It's a few hundred thousands, actually, few hundred thousand light years. So if light travels for a few hundred thousand years, then the distance it will cover is the length of one galaxy. So it consists. So this galaxy can uh, have uh, has uh, almost one hundred billion stars. And when I'm talking about the clusters of galaxies in the universe, I'm talking about 100 billion galaxies, right? So in cosmology, when we do computer simulations at the cosmological level, we consider one galaxy as a single point particle, right? It's a big thing, but we still consider. So you just, just imagine, just, just extend your imagination about the distances I am talking about. So Einstein's theory has not been tested at the scales of the clusters of galaxies, the galaxy cluster. So this is also one of the challenges that Einstein was right, or which modification theory is the right candidate? Modified theory is the right candidate, third. The fourth very interesting challenge in cosmology is actually about understanding how the universe was formed. So when the universe, the Big Bang happened, right after the Big Bang happened, there was a phase, there was a time, a small time when the universe expanded tremendously accelerated this expansion phase of the universe is called cosmic inflation and so after the inflation ended the universe all these quantum fluctuations and everything stretched out and the and all all the structures that we observe in the universe now the the the, the seeds for that structure formation started during during inflation so when inflation ended and when when i'm saying is ended it ended like in the fractions of a second, like in a billionth of a second, right? So that phase were very, very small, but that was a very important time. And then after that, universe went into a dark ages. We do not know what happened. And then it reappeared. And when it reappeared, I'm talking about the time when the first hydrogen atom was formed. The universe was like a soup. And the, and the hydrogen and uh, electron and proton and photon were all like a soup. And then the first atom was formed when the universe cooled down and the photon started to travel. What happened during the time of inflation? What is the physics of inflation? We do not know. And we can never observe that time. All we can observe in the universe is either the light coming from the Big Bang or the distribution of matter in the universe. And this distribution, depends upon the initial conditions of the inflation. So why it is so important? It is important because a lot of people know about what happens at CERN, right, CERN. So, so CERN wants to understand the universe or physics at a very small scales, what high energy physicists they want to understand. But the maximum distance, maximum scale that CERN can observe is only 14 tera electron volts. It's very small, but it's still not. And inflation happened at 16, 10 to the power 16 giga electron volts. So if you want to understand, if you want to probe the physics at this tiniest scale of inflation, you can never build a collider in the universe, uh, in, in, on Earth. You will have to probably build a collider of the size of the whole solar system, which is practically not possible. And the amount of energy you have to provide in the collider is actually impossible because at some point the beams will collapse into form black holes or whatever. So it's practically impossible to detect. The only our only hope to detect or understand the universe, the physics at the very extremely large high energies is if we can understand what happened during the time of inflation. Okay. So this is also very important. And that's why most of like very, very famous physicists like Neymar, Kani Hamed and Maldesina in 2015, they wrote a very interesting paper together and it's called cosmological collider physics. So cosmology as a collider physics. And so the cosmology is the only hope now for high energy physicists to understand the physics at very extremely high energy. So these are, the, these are the open challenges. Of course, there are different challenges as well. Uh, we do not know, uh, we do not understand how the galaxies are formed, the physics of the galaxy formation, we do not know. So model, to make models to describe how the galaxies are distributed, we still do not know because of very complicated modeling. Um, so the whole 
a whole field is getting mature, but I mean, there are a lot of things to do. And, uh, and it's very interesting because not only you can understand the physics at very high energies, the tools that you use to do the research are very practical tools. So you, you will be very good at data analysis. You will be good at writing like high performance computing code and you will be good at like, uh, like, uh, like, yeah, Bayesian analysis. And now, now just recently people have started to apply machine learning and, and computer simulations and developing computer simulations uh, in cosmology is also one of the big things and also applying machine learning ideas to extract information and extract patterns. It's also another big thing. So there are a lot of interesting uh, problems in cosmology right now that one can do. So, sir, I was teaching my younger sister the other day about scalar and vector quantities, and she asked a very um, interesting question, like, does time have a direction or not? And then I searched it up on the internet, and then I came to know that this is actually a very big theoretical question. Uh, what's your take on this? What is the nature of time? I don't know, because it's a very complicated thing, but, uh, but when in physics, when we talk about time, we talk, we do... Uh, we do talk about space and time, right? So space and time are not the separate things. In, in Newtonian mechanics, space and time are, 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 uh, are different quantities, but in Einstein's theory um, uh, and in physics that we, we do, in cosmology also, space and time are one single quantity. So what you talk about is space time, not space and time. But even if we talk about space time, Time is very different uh, than space because time only is uh, so space can you can you can basically uh, so if you write down the 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 the, the matrix so what is a matrix so uh, when when you when you when you take two two points point A and point B in any Cartesian coordinate system and you say okay what is the distance between point A and point B you say the the shortest part point A from point B is the distance between point A and point B right you know you can you can calculate the distance. So this distance is called the matrix, right? you know, you know, if you have x1, x2, and x, so basically x, y, and, and the other points, you, how do you calculate the distance? You take the difference in the x values and the y values and square root, square, square the distance, sum it and take the square root. So this is the metric, you know, when you talk about space time, the, you do the same thing, but, but the sign changes. So when you take the difference and and take the square of the difference of the time quantity, you have to multiply it by minus and then sum over all the spatial quantities. And this minus sign, and it's a convention, either you can put minus sign with the, with the time and, and, uh, and plus sign with the, with, the, with the space or plus sign of the time and minus sign of the space, it's a convention. But this difference between plus and minus sign, it's a very, it's a very fundamental difference between the diff, nature of the uh, how time is different than than, than 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 space. But I I do not want to go into the complicated things. Just for your understanding is you know time is something which only can go in one direction, right? It has a direction, time arrow of the time, and space you can basically change the di direction, and, and but it, for the time you cannot. So it only goes in one direction. Um, yeah. Otherwise, if time can go in the backward direction as well, you could actually reconstruct, you can basically go back in time and, and reconstruct uh, the, the, the initial image of the universe, um, which is not possible because, because of something called entropy and it depends on the era of time. Uh, so sir, some of your recent projects and startups, um, actually I understood that you have a deep interest in economics and business side of things. So sir, why don't you touch upon the interdisciplinary approach between physics and economics and how concepts of physics can be applied in economics? That's actually a very good point. Um, and thanks for pointing that out. Um, actually I forgot to ask like about your introduction, like what do you do at this time, at this point? So uh, sir, my name is Gaurav. Um, I'm in the first year of A-level. So Basically, yeah, I started this project called Scientific Dialogue. It was just to create a scientific community in Pakistan. And specifically, I am targeting my own city, Karachi. So we'll be yeah. having conducting physical sessions and you know training students for different competitions, such as you must have heard of International Young Physicist Tournament as well. 
So we are mm -hmm. going to participate in that as well. So that's how we want to create a scientific community. And then, you know, uh, in future, we might collaborate and do some research together, hopefully. So that's the goal. Thanks for your introduction. The, the reason I ask is because the question about like applying ideas in physics to different things is a very interesting question. Um, and it's a very interesting question. It's still, I mean, I mean, I, so I was talking like, uh, so I, right now, so I was talking to one of my, like few of my colleagues over lunch and, and they are doing research in physics and, and they were showing us uh, and they were talking about like a, like a, like a cosmologist who actually, and one guy was telling that, you know, he does some consulting projects on side and, and this is quite interesting how cosmologists can work on some business projects. And I was like, okay, I can, I also do it sometimes from time to time. And this is quite normal. And they were very surprised. Like, how can you do that thing? It's a very completely different thing. So even like a very mature, very professional researchers, they have absolutely no idea in, in physics as a physicist. Uh, that they can solve a lot of problems other than physics. Physics, physics is a very interesting thing. So one of the things that people don't understand, people say, okay, if you're doing physics, that, that means you can only do research or teaching. I mean, what's the point of spending so much time and so much your precious life uh, uh, understanding something which you do not know and like what is happening? Who cares about like what is happening at the fundamental level, right? Like whether whether you have good job and you can feed you and your family, this is much more important. But who cares about what is happening at the strings level? Who cares about how galaxies are distributed around the universe and whatever? A lot of people can say that, right? So what's the purpose? What's the point of spending so much time and understanding doing physics is not easy. You know, you have to spend, you have to do master, undergraduate and masters and research and PhD and then postdocs and a lot of research and papers and publications. And, um, and there's a lot of sacrifice as well. Uh, it's not an easy life. Um, so what's the point? The thing is like the skills you learn as a physicist, see, the skills you learn as a physicist are extremely good. You can never, you can never learn those skills in any field. And I can, I'm saying it with extreme confidence. Um, and this is my opinion, people can differ of course, but as a physicist, the skills you learn are so great, like understanding why. Because as a, as a physicist, you and as a cosmologist, you are understanding the most complicated system in the universe, which is the universe, right? This is the most complicated system. Like it can, the thing that you can never observe and with your naked eye, but with your imagination, with, with computer, with paper and pencil and everything, you can predict something which surprisingly works, you know? And this idea of how you understand something at the very fundamental level, how you can model the most complicated systems are the skills that physicists learn. Physicists know, because when you do about cosmology, we make assumptions, right? So when, when I study cosmology and when anyone study cosmology, we, we, we model the whole universe as a fluid, right? As a fluid. Can you imagine like, you know, understanding the universe, like galaxies and everything is behaves like a fluid. And then it has a pressure and there's a viscosity and everything. It sometimes doesn't make sense, but it is a very good modeling. You know, it can give us very good understanding about everything. So the idea is like, we are very good at understanding how complex systems work and how to model complex systems, any complex system from the very first principles, right? And then we, people who are doing this physics, physics they're very good at understanding uh, complicated mathematics. They are very good at using practical skills. Like, you know, you, you have to be very good at uh, programming. You have to be very good at statistics. You have to be very good at data analysis. And these are the tools that you really need to solve any problems in anything, right? So I learned it from the very beginning, from, from a long time ago. And I learned it from my own professors and everything, and also from my own understanding. And so, I mean, I, 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 I this is my interest, like understand, like uh, I'm interested in economics, I'm interested in business, I'm interested in like applying my research methodology to solve problems. So for example, recently I've been working on a project. I cannot disclose their information because it's a very 
it's, um, it's yeah. So I cannot disclose information, but I'm working on like projects uh, about about carbon emissions and high, and alternative fuels and how to construct a model for 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 how to how construct a model so you can calculate the carbon emissions from the birth of the fuel like the fuel production fuel and distribution and and vehicle productions and alternative and different different fuel systems so the whole models and different parts and understanding so i mean the idea is like you can actually do this thing as a physicist because all you have to know to do is apply your skills to understand the problem identify how to solve a problem and then come up with a solution so so that's why i mean i mean i'm interested in business and finance sometimes i do like projects with them and hopefully maybe in future who knows maybe i do this thing because i kind of like also sustainability and environmental things so probably this is one of the things that i'm also exploring on site but i mean you can do anything i mean i mean as a physicist a lot of physicists i know one of the examples i can tell you um, i do not know exactly know the name of the person but uh, there's a guy there's a, there's a famous professor um, i don't know i forgot sorry about that but he he did his phd in particle physics from cambridge uh, with professor abdus salam in 1959 and then he his wife was a biologist he uh, got a job he became assistant professor of physics at harvard university and then he switched his field so he became a, he became interested in molecular biology in chemistry and everything he got a nobel prize in chemistry in 1970s he started his company called genentech a uh, biogen or genentech one of these companies and it's one of the most famous pharmaceutical company right now so a physicist who worked on particle physics he got a nobel prize in chemistry and then he started one of the most successful pharmaceutical company in the world so one other thing that i mean physics is definitely interesting so someone who's passionate about physics i mean they should definitely go and do work but as a physicist i mean um, and as a person i mean i i would advise for young people like you and other people who are listening um you know the most important the most important thing is identifying problems right last century belonged to physics there were a lot of problems and there were a lot of revolutions came people working in physics i don't even what are the what are the problems what are the problem that you need to solve uh, to make a world a better place that is very more, more important if you do and spend your whole precious life on something which has no use uh, which is aimless i don't know i mean i mean you have to find something which you can which which can drive you which which can motivate you to work uh, with full potential so i think there are a lot of challenges in the universe, in, in in the world right now and one of the things that i can see it's it's environment um definitely we are screwed up Uh, our our world is becoming worse and worse and we are responsible for that and uh, and the emission the carbon emission is increasing and i was reading a report published by goldman sachs recently it's called carbonomics and you can go and search online carbonomics is a 90 page report published by goldman sachs and you know recently in paris like a lot of uh, countries and, and and organization they 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 met and they they promised and uh, the world that they will achieve net zero emission by 2050 by 2050 the world will be uh, at least not the whole world but major countries participated in paris agreement they should achieve uh, oh, 2050 and what are the pathways to achieve 20, like net emission by 2050 so basically the, the report published by goldman sachs they 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 provided two different pathways was so one was a very realistic pathway one was a very idealistic pathway and i was surprised even if you go with a very idealistic pathway where you are achieving uh, net zero emission by 2050 still then the global temperature will increase by 1.5 degree that's a lot you can already see if you are based in karachi i don't know if you are based in karachi or wherever you can already already see like climate climate variations like uh, in every part of the world even in europe like you know you can see variations in climate 
And imagine like, you know, if the global temperature will increase by 1.5% of 1.5 degree, and I don't know if we can achieve realistically this target. So, I mean, I'm talking about like two or three degree uh, centigrade increase in global temperature. So that's a big, big problem. And, in, and, and achieving net emission is not an easy task. You have to reinvent the whole infrastructure, right? And so there are different technologies that people can develop. Uh, so one of the technology, for example, right now, everyone is focusing about electric cars. So electric cars are environmental friendly. I talk, I tell the people, you know, it's very easy to, you know, there is a book called Factfulness and, and, and you can have a look and I can talk about later, but, but the idea is like, there's so much noise in our surrounding, then even the educated ones among us, they cannot see what is the right and what is wrong. So the truth is always hidden in noise. We all, what all we always observe, like believe, is what we hear from media and other people, and we always think. But the truth is something different. And I recently found out that um, that even the carbon, even electric cars, are not not environmental friendly. Um, it's actually worse for the environment. Uh, it depends on where you are driving the car and, and and how you're producing electricity. In Pakistan, for example, is still 46 percent or more than 46 percent of electricity is generated by coal. Right. So if you are driving an electric car in Pakistan, you're actually doing worse for the environment and the production of the electric car, because production of the battery, it's, it's, it emits a lot of carbon emission. Um, so, you know, so if you have an electric car and if you have a normal diesel car, right. And um, so for an electric car to become more environmental friendly, um, it will have to, you have to run it like 40,000 kilometers. Right. So basically you have to wait four or five years. And then after four or five years, your car will become greener. But after four or five years, probably your battery will die. So you have to change the battery, which means you're producing more carbon emission. And then after your battery will die, everything, what will you do? Because we do not have the infrastructure for the recycling of the batteries. Right. And um, so these are the challenges. And then how can you how can you generate alternative fuels? So what are the alternative fuels? So for example, this carbon this oil and natural gas will decline after 2025, right? And uh, and then this alternative fuels will rise, but how can you generate your alternative fuels? Uh, what are the ways you can generate your alternative fuels? How can you increase the efficiency? How can you develop the technology to capture carbon from, from the environment? So one of the very easy way to capture carbon is, is planting more trees, right? But can you develop technology to carbon to capture carbon? So carbon capture technologies. This is very, very important. People have developed it, uh, but it's very expensive and they can only use it on site. Uh, but if you can develop like carbon capture technologies and in install it in, uh, in in your in your car to capture carbon, this is great. I mean, I mean, you can so there are several ways you can think of like what are the right way to do. And identifying the problem is the most difficult part in research. Once you can identify the problem, if you have the right set, set of skills, you can come up with a solution. So if you want to develop a beta enable technologies, I mean, there are a lot of things you can do, especially in Pakistan as well, you can do a lot of things, especially in environmental things, especially in technology things. So, but identify the right challenges, like what are the challenges we need, we are, we are facing right now. So COVID, for example, was another challenge, right? Not only COVID, COVID has just showed us like one, one potential threat, right? There could be like other potential threat. So ap applying uh, or, or focusing more on the biology side or focusing more on like developing future vaccines and, and therapeutics is one thing. In Pakistan, for example, there's a major challenge for diagnostic diseases. We still do not have like um, tools to diagnose uh, the diseases you know, developing tools for the diagnostic therapeutics, also therapeutics and diagnostic is, is again, like a great, great stuff to do. We still, we do not have anything in Pakistan, like even like the pharmaceutical company doesn't exist, uh, sector that doesn't exist in Pakistan, we have to import all this uh, thing. So anyway, there's a lot of things and AI, for example, is another big thing, artificial intelligence and, and applying the idea 
in drug discovery is also one of the challenges. So drug discovery, biology, environment, there's so many challenges we, we face right now. And so, I mean, I would definitely encourage people who want to do something interesting. I mean, look at these things. These are very interesting challenges you can solve and you can, you can, you can come up with like interesting solutions which can help a lot of people. Um, sir, so I understand what you're saying, but then again, sir, how do we actually start off? For example, do we get funding for a research project or do we start off by starting up a business or something, getting, a, getting funding from a venture capitalist? How do we start off basically? Uh, so first of the thing, one of the things that you have, you can do right now, we, we, we have all the knowledge available, right? Google. And so one of the things you can do is start reading, right? Read a lot, read a lot, understand everything and just do not understand uh, superficially. I'm talking about actually do not trust what media is saying, uh, trust maybe like what research and reports, analyze the data, develop some some skills to analyze uh, these things. So read a lot, come up with a solution and come up with a product. And once you have the solution and the product, I mean, there is no age to start uh, um, a business or, or a startup, but make sure that uh, you, you have some interesting uh, problems and you have some interesting solutions and your solutions can help a lot of people and the environment or whatever you want to do. And this is a, a trial and error thing. The more you do, the more you learn. So it's about, I mean, this is, this is kind of, um, this is something like, um, like how you learn to swim. You do not learn to swim by taking classes or like reading books and lectures. You just swim, you just dive in the water and just, just, you know, learn. I mean, that's how you learn entrepreneurship. That's how you solve problems. That's how you learn research. You just dive into it and you learn what you need to solve the problem at that time. You don't need to learn everything and then start research. No. All right, so, yeah. sir, my last question to you would be like, um, you mentioned a lot of interesting things, but uh, it sometimes seems like you are more inclined towards startup life and life as an entrepreneur than as a researcher. Uh, what's your final take on this? Like, uh, would you choose a life as a researcher or as an entrepreneur? Uh, I mean, at the moment, I'm doing both. Uh, I am uh, I'm doing research, but I do like uh, uh, on my side. I, I do like some projects, uh, uh, not directly involved in, in any entrepreneurial projects. I mean, I did started some projects with my friends at Cambridge, and we wanted to start something related to therapeutics. But then it's a very difficult. Uh, we adopt. We, we we got some funding as well, but but because uh, the plans changed and we postponed it for the future thing. But we learned a lot from this whole process. Um, I am actually interested, and in, I do I do want to do both. Actually, ideally, I would do want to do both. I mean, research is quite interesting. I like research, and um, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, as far as I can do both, I will do both. Um, that's my that's my idea, but I don't know if some at some point um, uh, I I think I would like to do one thing or the other. I would choose, uh, but as far as I'm enjoying, I'm I'm enjoying, <laughs> and I'm enjoying both of the things. I'm doing both, um, but you know, like my I mean I mean our interest changes with time, uh, and so the world is changing. We are changing. Our interest is changing. If you are evolving, your interest is changing. This is great. This is a sign that you are curious. If your interests are not changing, you're stuck at something. That is that means something is wrong with you, right? Uh, sir, it's it's been. I honestly am amazed at how much knowledge you have and the depth of understanding you have of everything. Honestly, uh, you've impressed me by all means. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. sir, for taking out time from your busy schedule. Thank you very much for this. Thank you. No, I mean, thank you for approaching and um, I'm glad to hear that that was useful and um, I don't know, I mean, if, if someone finds it useful, then I would be very happy because this is what uh, I also tell to my friends uh, who are doing research and, and, um, and one of the things, again, I would emphasize is do not focus on, on the content of what you're doing, focus on the outcomes. Uh, focus on the skills. So skill-based learning is more important. Content-based learning is not important. So your degree won't matter at the end. What matters is what skills you have. Um, so this is actually very, very important. And even for the PhDs, 
uh, my take on PhDs is, um, I mean, you are still very young, but, but I mean, you can understand it, that what the degree we get is doctor of philosophy, right? The people who are interested in PhDs, we do not get degrees in doctor in physics or doctor in social science or doctor in engineering. We all get the same degree, which is doctor of philosophy, which means like after achieving this degree, you should be able to understand a problem, find an interesting problem, understand a problem, and, and be able to find a solution to that problem. That's what the degree is telling you. Uh, it's, it's saying that you should be able to do that. Not that you can only be able to solve the problem in your particular field. I mean, after this, you should be able to, to do in, uh, other things. So this is very important and, and make sure, and people who are listening, I mean, and the young students, I mean, to make sure the focus on the skill-based learning rather than the content-based learning, because Google always knows more than us and we can never beat Google. So we can only beat Google if we have the right skill set. Uh, sir, thank you very much. I hope to see you soon. Good luck for all the projects that you are doing. I hope you have great success in everything. Have a nice evening to you and see you soon.